Is Kerbal Space Program just too easy? Do you find yourself no longer being challenged by anything in the game anymore? Do the three hardest and most notorious destinations, Moho, Tylo, and Eve, just not even phase you anymore? Do you feel that this game is simply not frustrating and torturous enough? Well, my friend, I've got just the challenge for you. Allow me to introduce Super Tylo. Made after Bob Kerman, upon using his newfound god powers, decided to rearrange the entire Kerbal system. In doing this, he gave Tylo a healthy dose of steroids, and now it's become the biggest, meanest planet around. Ignore Jewel over there, he's cool. With a radius of 1100 kilometers and weighing in at over 13 times the mass of Kerbin, Tylo now boasts a surface gravity over four times greater than that of the Kerbal's homeworld. To top it off, it's also got a very thin atmosphere that threatens to incinerate anything coming too close to the planet at its mind-bending orbital velocity of 6.5 kilometers per second. Yeah, sounds like fun, doesn't it? Yeah, well guess what? Today, we're gonna land on it. And return. With two Kerbals. And a rover. Using a powered landing, because this has already been done with parachutes, and I want to be the first to do it without them. Let's begin. However, before we continue, let's ask one of the real questions. What else did Bob do to the Kerbal system during his rampage of godly power? Well, as it turns out, quite a lot. For starters, take a look into the sky. That's right, Kerbin is now a moon of Jewel alongside the moon Minmus, Leif, and Paul, which looks like it's made out of Cheeto dust. Interesting. This is actually quite fortunate and that means that, thanks to the Oberth effect, Jewel's gravity will make it much easier for us to do interplanetary transfers. Taking a look at the whole system, we can see that Bob changed everything else as well, including Ike and Gilly, which have been literally reduced to mere comets. Not sure what he had against them. And he also made Elu much larger and gave it Val as a moon. Hmm. This description looks familiar. Also, speaking of descriptions, Bop is now being called worthless. Such a pitiful insult being directed at a literal space rock, am I right? <laughs> I would never spite a space Various object in such a manner. Never. And finally, we come to Tylo itself, which only has one moon, which is Duna, which now greatly resembles the real-life Mars. Yep, Tylo only has one moon and has never had any others to speak of. Why would you think otherwise, dear viewer? Is it possible that the cursed Drez was, an was, an <laughs> was another moon of Tylo that I had to dispose of? Ridiculous. Go back to bed. This is Bob we're talking about. Drez was never real. <clears throat> Anyways, we're here to build rockets, right? Not look at the pretty planets. The first thing that we'll obviously need to land on Super Tylo is an extremely powerful lander. One that can overcome the crushing gravity of the planet's surface and then some to lift off. For this purpose, I present to you the brick. I called that because I'm nearly certain it will hurtle into Tylo's surface like a brick dropped off a building directly onto Mars' forehead. Packed with Vector and Mammoth engines, it's got the thrust to overcome Tylo's gravity, and, with a few heat shields, we should be able to slow down, right? Right? Moving up a bit, we find the mining system, which will allow us to refuel on the surface. Because landing this thing fully fueled would entail a part count of a launch vehicle so high that it would cause a numerical overflow on my PC. We also have an as-of-yet unnamed rover, which I want to try to conduct a long-range exploration with, as some of the terrain on Tylo looks pretty interesting. That is, if we can even get anywhere before all of our wheels just pop due to the gravity, as they kept doing on earlier test designs, including one where the mere spring strength of the wheels was enough to send it tumbling around like it was on something. I mean, in testing, this thing literally reached 150 meters per second, so if it can go that fast, everything should be fine, right? Next, we have the upper stages, which continue the brick's trend of necessity having stupidly high thrust. All told, it has about 7.5 kilometers per second of delta-v, enough to just reach low orbit from the surface of Tylo. Theoretically, anyways. Finally, there is the landing booster, which, by itself, raises the mass of the brick to nearly 3,000 tons. Yeah, that's gonna be a fun payload to launch from Kerbin. 
Let's test land this thing already. Shouldn't be too hard, yeah? Right, let's try adding more heat shields to keep the engines cool. Yeah! Okay, things are not looking good. Alright, new plan. This lander is dog sh Not to mention, it's not even fulfilling my original goal of making a power landing anyways. So get out of here, brick. No one loves you. Not even Kevin McAllister. Go home. everyone, say hello to the sandwich! <laughs> sandwich... Why are you laughing? It's a good name! The name is an acronym, alright, derived from its predecessor, the comparatively lame lander. Lame. As, believe it or not, at the time of making it, I still thought the brick was a better lander, as I wanted to carry four kernels instead of two. What a fool I was. The NA part stands for no atmosphere, as in my design process, I'm just gonna pretend that Tylo's atmosphere doesn't exist, cause, you know, if it doesn't exist, it can't hurt me, right? As for the actual name itself, Sandwich, that's just name that because the, the command module being in the center of everything reminded me of the contents of a sandwich between the slices of bread. And also because I'm hungry, okay? Let's start testing it. Much the same as the stupid, pathetic brick before it, the sandwich also suffered its fair share of abject failures. Mostly due to it not being able to quite slow down enough before Tylo's gravity just yanked it downwards. However, after only a couple of attempts, I was able to come remarkably close to an actual landing, with the sandwich getting down to only Mach 1 before its fuel ran out. This filled me with newfound confidence, as this was miles better than the brick had ever done, with that piece of filth only ever reaching about one kilometer per second before smearing its useless parts across the surface of Tylo. Emboldened by this, I decided to add one last booster stage to its lower descent module before finalizing the design. Except, this design was not final at all, as we still need to make a few crucial additions. Notice anything missing here? No, it's not my sanity. It's a way for the Kerbals to actually get down to the surface and back up with their spines intact. In order to remedy this problem, we need ladders. One addition of a sketchy-ass ladder system later, we now had the ability to get our crew back to the capsule after landing. Except, we actually didn't. At all. You see, it turns out that Tylo is such a dense boy that its gravity is so high that Kerbals are straight up unable to climb up ladders, making them completely useless. Awesome. In order to fix this debacle, I'm going to use a technique that I've used on EVE landers before. <laughs> crew transfers. You see, if you have two command modules on a vessel, you can transfer crew between them at any time, regardless of how far apart they are or if any obstructions like that may be in the way. I, I don't know, it's like each crew capsule's got a teleporter <laughs> inside or something. Which really begs the question, if Kerbals can teleport, why do they need rockets to go to their planets? Like what? Checkmate teleportation deniers. Now that the last major issue of the sandwich had been resolved, it was time to go back to attempting to test land it to prove its worthiness.
All of this lander testing is stressing me out. Let's do a quick mission to Bop to relieve some stress. The tall, straight back. Allow your arms to rest gently. When you're ready, close your eyes. Bring full attention to this very moment. Settling in and allowing the mind and body to still. And with openness, patience, and curiosity, bring your awareness to the breath. Ah, that's much better. After this mission of meditation, I was able to get the sandwich prototype down to a speed of only 150 meters per second before running out of fuel, which made me almost sure that it would be possible to land as long as my trajectory was very precise. He got it! In order to boost my confidence further, I decided to add a couple of air brakes and parachutes, which, while it technically makes the lander not entirely land under its own power, is okay because I was only aiming for an almost entirely powered landing this whole time. I'm not gaslighting, gaslighting isn't real. Now that I have a somewhat passable level of confidence that the sandwich will actually succeed in landing, it's time to think about how we will actually get it to Tylo. Given its ridiculously high thrust to weight ratio and delta V, it would be more than possible to launch it straight into low carbon orbit with only one added booster stage on the outside. Sounds like an easy plan. Let's launch. Most marvelous, the sandwich is in orbit. However, it's kind of just stuck here. And so we need a way of refueling it so it can continue its journey. Enter the incredibly named Refuel Module B, which, if you can believe it, will be used to refuel the sandwich. It consists of just a few fuel tanks and a tweak scale booster, so launching it will be a piece of cake. However, shortly after the launch, this happened. happened again. Anyways, it now appears that Bob and the Kraken are now actively colluding to prevent me from completing this challenge. I will not tolerate this. I see through their trickery. I shall remove this fairing and... Okay, finally we've got a successful launch. Following this, I then made the rendezvous and went into dock. Except, this docking went horribly wrong. First of all, there was the fact that I could barely even turn this absolute whale. As fully fueled, this tanker's mass pushes 3,000 tons. What this meant is that by the time I successfully turned it in the right direction, I was already moving again relative to the sandwich. Oh yeah, and there was also this thing that happened during time warp. I, again, checkmate teleportation deniers. To further add to my frustration, the frame rate for some reason became extremely low after I started recording, and stay low only when I was recording. Whenever I stopped recording, I would be back to more than 30 FPS, as opposed to the 10 or so I'm getting here. Finally, there was the most glaring problem of all. The claw's fingers were too fat to grab onto the fuel tank, and it repeatedly bounced off it when I went in from the side. I then tried to grab onto the flat front end of the fuel tank, but once again was met with failure. Well, this doesn't bode well. My theory as to why this happened is simple. Me, in all of my wisdom, used tweak scale to make this claw twice its normal size, as I thought doing so would make the docking easier. However, it appears that this has instead had the opposite effect, and this has backfired spectacularly. 
And now I'm stuck with a useless fuel tanker in low carbon orbit. You know what we do to useless craft steer viewer? That's right. Whack a Kerbal Activate. Projectile. Cube. Mass. 4. Velocity. 100. Target acquired. Charging up throw. Kablamo. <sighs> well, it's back to the drawing board again. I really don't want to have to launch the entire sandwich all over again, so instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is exercise the definition of insanity a little bit by doing the same exact thing again, this time with an adapter that will use a normal size clock connected to a docking port. After defying the odds and swiftly attaching to the fuel tank with just a claw to spite me, the adapter module had been put into place, and it was time to launch the new fuel module, this time with an actual docking port and more RCS. Upon reaching the sandwich once more, I still found it very difficult to align the docking ports correctly, as there would always be a tiny bit of residual velocity left that would throw me off. That is, until I finally figured out how to actually use the RCS controls after playing this game for over seven years, using the H, J, K, and L keys to actually move the prograde marker around. Wow, I... I am... brilliant. Despite my newfound knowledge, it still took three different attempts to dock, as twice, even though they were all but perfectly aligned, the docking ports literally just gave me the middle finger and bounced off one another. In spite of this, I pressed on, and... docked successfully. The sandwich was now ready to be refueled to make the journey all the way out to Tylo. Stay tuned for next time where we will undertake this journey as well as meet our heroes, the brave Kerbinauts Nedzer and Harry Kerman. Thanks for watching.